Welcome, welcome to 561 Music. Talking all things South Florida music with a different artist each week. Check it by the scene. It's what we're doing. One. Come and check it out. It's what we're all about. 561 Music! So, Hector is not here today, so I don't get to say, How are you, Hector? A little bit of a shame, but uh, he will be back next week. He's just uh, he had some stuff to do, so he couldn't make it. Um, I, so what we usually do at the beginning of these is I talk about what Kilberleys were doing over the weekend, and um, we had a gig at Kilted Mermaid and uh, on Friday, and that was great. Kilted Mermaid's always a lot of fun. Actually, this time was particularly fun. It was nice and busy, and we had some friends come visit. Um, Luna, one of our friends, she came down and uh, hung out. And so, yeah, that was a blast. And then we had, on Saturday, we had the square group of, James and I at the square group of from three to six, and that was cool. Um, we, we do that every two weeks and uh, it's a good sort of standing show but then also there was the 561 live and local toy drive um, and that was uh, fantastic it, it, it went really well um, I'd never been to that spot there the the Northwood Arts and Music Warehouse um, it's the first time I've ever been there and it's really cool I've, we got to do more gigs there in fact Butch and the Fat Dubes which is um, a band that I've joined um, we're going to do uh, a live album there because, you know, we thought the room was so cool. And, and Ricky um, Ballou from Long Live the Scene, who was um, the co-host of the event on Saturday, yeah, he just sort of brought up the idea. He was like, why don't we do a live album here and, you know, charge a bit of admission on the door to pay for the um, the physical release and all that. So, so yeah, Butch is going to have a... A new live album, which is pretty exciting. So anyway, if you've never been to Northwood Arts and Music Warehouse, you should go check it out. It, it, it's just so cool. You can wander through people's galleries and, and the places there are to play are super nice. And, and it was fun too because all of our friends were there. You know, Justin was there and, and Hector and Ricky and all the people from the bands that we know. And we had some um, live music community um, bands playing there, like the Fire Breathing Rubber Duckies. Now, the Fire Breathing Rubber Duckies are just the coolest young band. They're so awesome. It's really up my street. It's just kind of, you know, raw punk rock played by teenagers. You know, it doesn't get any any better than that, really. You know, it's remind me of the Descendants or something like that. It was really cool. And um, and then on Sunday, um, we did a benefit at Stormhouse Brewing. Um, and that was really cool. That, that's down in uh, Palm Beach Gardens. And we had a good time at that. We played in the afternoon. Um, we'd never played at Stormhouse Brewing before, so it was nice to go check that place out. But they'd built up this whole market around it. So it was really a weekend of sort of festivals and kind of bigger gigs, and it was it was good times. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, Steve Abbott with us today. How's it going, Steve? Oh, rock and roll. Not nearly as busy as you, my friend, but uh, <laughs> doing good, brother. Good to be here. Well, you know, I, I was going to say Steve Abbott from the Hard Riches, but you're so much more than that that yeah. I just figured Steve Abbott. Steve you know. Abbott works. Yeah. I've been called a lot worse. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, talking to the Hard Riches, though, um, that's how I first met you because uh, I'd known Matt Krug, who was in the Hard Riches, yeah, yeah. and um, and that was kind of my gateway through to, to meeting you. And, um, and then we were practicing at your place for a long time. Yes, and, yes, yes. So why don't we talk a little bit about the Hard Richards. Um, firstly, who came up with the name? <laughs> oh, man, that was uh, many years ago. It was, I think it was the end of high school, and we were all hanging out one night, and one of our buddies, Josh, was like, we were trying to figure out a band name. We had a bunch of terrible names, I'm sure, and... He was like, you guys should call yourself the Hard Richards because you're a bunch of dicks. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, it kind of stuck, you know. We, it cracked us up. And, you know, the more we thought about it, it was just a good little play on words. And at, like I like to always say, it kind of sounded classy almost until you kind of got the gist of what the play on words <laughs> was. And I mean, I, I have too many funny stories of people coming up to me that I didn't even know. And they're like... I've seen you guys, you know, 10 times and I just finally figured out what your name means and it blows my mind because it's the first thing I think of when I think of a hard Richards with a bunch of dicks because that's how it started basically back then. I think um, 
It just depends on the kind of brain you got. The first thing I thought when I heard the name was, you know, the dicks. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. I, I, you know, I have a, when I was very young, when we were going to play a show somewhere, like in Gainesville or something, uh, my parents would go to church on Sundays and stuff, and they put us on the prayer list. And the pastor actually read my parents' request for a prayer request right there in front of the whole congregation. And my mom said half the place started laughing, and half of them gasped and couldn't believe what the pastor said. Oh. And uh, he came up to my father afterward and said, we're going to have to have a talk about your son's band. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's yeah, really it's good funny. Stuff. It's good so, stuff. yeah, if there was ever a reason to call the band that, I think it, it, it served its purpose just in that one event. In that one, it? yeah, for sure. And there's been plenty <laughs> since then, and I know... Uh, I know many people just remember it, uh, obviously, because of the antics and the good times, but uh, probably the name keeps them coming, you know, too, and they're like, oh, the Hard Richards, you know, I remember that. You yeah, know, it's so hilarious. It's stuck. So, Always pick a good band name. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know. It's <laughs> or if important. you don't have one, just go with no name. There you go. Yeah, that's what we did. Yeah, we did the anti-pick a name. Yeah, we just that, didn't works, that works, too. So when did, you, when did the band start? So uh, I'd like to say that, you know, when it originally really started was probably when we were in high school and Brian and I like the idea of playing music came to fruition then for sure he had a guitar and we'd hang out at his house and uh, you know we'd always write music and you know we saved up some money and got the little four, you know four track recorder and you know try to figure out how to do it and finally came to the point where we had a couple songs and we knew someone that played uh, drums so we got a you know cheap drum set and started playing and uh our buddy's walk-in freezer at his house. I don't know why this house had a walk-in freezer in the backyard, but it did. Best it not to think about huge. it too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we tried not to, and it was empty. So we literally would set up in there, and as a three-piece, Brian playing guitar, a drummer, and me singing, no bass player for a while. And then uh, uh, our buddy Stevie McKean, he was a younger, much younger than us, but he was in the scene in the area. He jumped in, and he was just an amazing musician. You know, he, oh, cool. he, he was left-handed, and he played a right-handed bass upside down, backwards, the whole nine yards. So and how old are you at this point? You were like 16? You were probably like right right down there about 17, I think, because right. we were playing house parties mainly, right. uh, you know, finding out where the party was that weekend, going and getting kegs and, you know, setting the amps up and just rocking someone's backyard. And around here, that could be anything from a mansion on the intercoastal to a cow field out in Wellington, you yeah. Yeah, you know, and you're yeah. just rocking all these shows every weekend. And then uh, we finally got like, uh, I, I want to say we were 17, 18, not even old enough to even play at bars and stuff like that. And we had an opportunity to play at a, a video premiere or something like that because of Nomad Surf Shop and uh, played a lost party and got in with that venue. And whenever they you know, had something, they would have us do it for them. And nice. it kind of just started taking off from there, still doing all the... Uh, you know, the, the backyard parties and all that. and Well, this is something that I tell a lot of the younger bands, um, and we all do here at Live Music Communities. Like, you know, if if you can't play the bars yet and you can't, you know, play those kind of venues, just organize your own shows. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and that's, I mean, back then you'd write up a couple of flyers, go to Kinko's, print them out, and leave them at all the spots and yeah, hope yeah. someone showed up in that random place where there was power and... It was weird, you know. I mean, we would play shows, and the venue would be closed, and we'd have everybody come back to our pad, and we'd set up in the living room, and to have all these random people from you know down in Coral Springs to you know Fort Pierce in our living room, and we're just playing a show, and you know having the time of our life, you know. So you know, you were you, you sort of brought up the scene um, then when you were sort of 17, 18, um, what's the scene you're talking about? Like the, the punk scene? Yeah, yeah. There was a, a punk ska scene that was starting back then around here. We had like Gigolo Big and the Barflies, the Worms. Uh, we always had the Crumbs down south. Against All Authority was around that same time. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of fun angst and this new music for most of us, you know, ska was a you know, I, I remember when Brian was like, oh, you got to hear this. And I was like, what is ska? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. And I, I was probably 16. And at that point, I was on this, you know, when I was 16, 17, I was on, really into like minor threat, no effects, uh, you know, that the West Coast punk rock scene. 
uh, surf punk, skate punk, you know, anything you'd hear in videos. And in Florida, we're so we were so far behind the other states. You sure. Know? We get music, you know, two years later that they've already had three albums released in Cali. I, I guess so. especially, you know, prior to the internet. Yeah, oh, yeah, this is way before the internet. This is yeah. the only way you got records was to go to stores, you know, record stores, and find an album. And you're like, holy cow, this is an album. I never heard of this. You know, Screeching Weasel, I remember fingering through, yeah. you know, at, at, at record stores and finding, like, a Screeching Weasel or a Queries album and being like, whoa. Oh, you know what is this and there was no way to even know because you might only get to see them at one show and they're promoting that one album and they have four others out and wasn't so like real, it was. real deal punk rocker from back in the day yeah it was fun yeah it was, yeah, a, it yeah. was a good time i go to fau for shows uh in the pit there it just just uh, that's what made me want to play music was being in the crowd and seeing the energy and, and feeling that that camaraderie like yeah it wasn't a pit where you know if you get knocked down people are kicking you and you know running over you people, brothers were picking you up and yeah. you know you kept going and smiling and having the time of your life and when you leave you're spent you're done you're like that was the best show i've ever been to until the next one you go to and that was the best show you've ever been to yeah and that was just that very cathartic man just yeah. going to a show and just releasing all that energy like that it's just fantastic um you know it's like it, it, it's like that um, Op Ivy tune talks about, you know, it sound system. It's just, um, you know, it's it's just a great way to release, yeah. you know, all yeah. of this, all of this stuff. And I still, I still have that experience when I when I play shows. Now, oh, you know? yeah, I, I I tell people at times, especially friends and or people that I meet that have never done what we do. You know, and I, I consider myself first off very lucky. Sure, of all the opportunities all the musicians that gave me a chance to do what I do. Uh, I'm probably a lot different than most of the people you've had on here in the sense that, you know, I'm not the best guitar player in the world. Uh, you know, we've ne I've never had lessons or anything like that. Uh, I just got my first electric guitar that was brand new like two weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. everything else was a hand-me-down or something like that. And so I couldn't do, I couldn't, I couldn't do what I would love to do without other musicians right yeah doing their part to give me the opportunities so yeah, I've been yeah but that teaches blessed, you a lot of you know, you know I, I think that you know that'll shape your personality it means you you know good at working with people oh, team yeah. Play, oh you know. yeah totally I mean it's uh you know I was, I was the epitome of a uh, a lead singer, a front man, a band mom, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. kind of a band manager. If it wasn't for Matt, you know, I don't know what would have happened, you know, yeah, when yeah. Matt came in, you know, guys like that, that that's another thing we can, you know, we'll, we'll probably get to here, but as younger guys came into the band and that new blood came into the band and this new energy and new abilities that, you know, we were limited with before, you know, yeah, you know, so it was uh, interesting how it all progressed. Well, um, you know, it'd be fun to kind of take it nice and slowly through through the years, and, yeah. and probably a good way of doing that is to to hang things off uh, your three albums. Definitely. And so, why don't we why don't we bring up a picture of your first album? So, tell me a little bit about this. So, this is on the move. Uh, we probably had five or six of the ten or eleven songs I think that are on it. You know, done that we had played regularly, and then we wanted to write a couple more songs just for the album. Um, I want to say it was 96, somewhere around there, 97. Yeah. Uh, went to Miami to record it. Definitely got lost on the way down there multiple times. Where in Miami did you record <laughs> At it? At the remember? Dungeon Studio. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to think old Fred's still down there. That was many, many years ago. Uh, cool. It was this fun little studio. Of course, our first experience being in a real studio and... Uh, you know, we were very young at the time. Uh, yeah. You know, full of uh, gusto. I think some of us were just getting to the drinking age, so we could legally uh, partake and and, yeah. and overindulge and just <laughs> enjoy the moment we were living in there. And uh, I remember, you know, showing up a few times and just being like, "Oh, we're, we're not going to get anything done tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this isn't going to happen the way we envisioned." But it was a fun album. Uh, you know, we had. Definitely played a few quality shows at that time. Uh, I think we were doing a lot of shows at Spanky's and uh, Respectables at that time. So we were getting exposed to bigger crowds, uh, crowds that didn't know any of the type of music we were playing. That was our first probably exposure to, you know, playing, loving a type of music that not many people knew yet, you know. Yeah, I it, think even at the height of, of Scarpunk's kind of, you know, push and fame, it wasn't 
that big. I mean, it wasn't. You know. you know, there was a couple radio stations that might play it. Uh, they had little segments. You know, during uh, the buzz had uh, skanking to the beat on Saturday night. My boy Jeremy Loper would, uh, you know, have us come in sometimes, like interview us and play some of our music. But there was no opportunities for any. You know, mass appeal or yeah, you I know, think it for anybody. you know, there's this kind of um, nostalgia for like the peak of third wave and all that. But the truth is that there's like you know a couple of bands, and then in terms of sort of people going out and popularity and stuff, fell off pretty fast. From yeah. you know, a yeah. couple of bands that were huge bands, but but it wasn't like there was a bunch of huge yeah. bands. You yeah, know? there like, wasn't. And you know, getting back to on the move, that first album, I think it definitely set the pace for what kept us interesting through the years is that it takes you on a little journey of music you know we don't play one style of music we never yeah. never really have and and i don't even know if we fit into one style like i don't think you can say that we're a punk band or we're a ska band and maybe towards the end as it all molded together and it was a little fine a little more finely tuned i think we are more of a you know you could say a ska band or something like yeah. that um but I there think, was, you know, in my opinion, all the best bands move around through through genre, but because it shouldn't be that, you know, I, it's really just on a band by band basis. Definitely. But but I like it when people experiment. Like yeah, that. no, and you know, especially you know, as we grew and more players came into the band, uh, you know, it, it definitely changed some. But I think you really see our roots here with On the Move, uh, the very first song, Dog Beach Dub. We continued to play that song to our very last show. Yeah. It was usually our show opener. And it was just a good vibey South Florida, you know, reggae type of song with a bunch of kids that don't, shouldn't be playing reggae playing it at the time <laughs> and it was so vibe it was just such a good feeling to it and it definitely changed the, the first version that you can listen to now is nothing like what yeah, we yeah. play on stage you know 25 years later uh definitely progressed but the the same core was still there and that sure. song it's really nice that you you carried on playing a song from right at the beginning yeah. i think that yeah. that's a nice cut thread you know well, especially dog beach it was a uh, kind of like that was our our spot down here so just just uh, it kept everybody that knew us back then it kept them on the same page and i think yeah, totally. you know, when you're writing music or you're playing music or you're playing a live show it's it's important every once in a while Give somebody some, something they recognize and they yeah. can grab onto. So now all the stuff they've heard that you that your new stuff that they might never even been experienced to before makes sense. Totally, you know? so. Kilbilly still plays the first song I wrote for it, like "Get the Devil Off My Back." We still play that every gig. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah. it's one of those ones. You know, you guys almost would probably feel weird not playing it. Yeah, so, and that's how it was. Like it set the tone, and then you know the album definitely does that typical progression we do, where we play like a reggae vibe, and then we'll hit a like a ska punkish tone and then we go into a punk song you know yeah, what we yeah. consider you know and then we'll drop it back down and that's also how we like to play our sets too you know we'd start something to ease them in and build it up and then hit them and then bring it back down and so yeah, that man. way it's it, for me like if i'm if i'm the person in the crowd and i'm out there dancing i appreciate the fact that the band just gave me a song to catch my breath too and hey maybe have a sip of my water or whatever yeah. it is and, and get back Definitely. into it and build up and get that vibe going and have that whole energy with a rock band with it with a, a like a show band as opposed to kind of you know a band playing in the corner of a bar it's really important to consider these things you can't just go up up there and randomly play songs. No, it doesn't no. work. I, I used to. I used if you to have love... like half an hour, 40, 45 minutes, then you could. But you better make sure it's right. Yeah, yeah it's right. And, and there's a. You know, I, 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 you can simply say there's a story to be told with the progression or the the layout of a set or the layout of an album. Very often, there's a story to be told in the song progression and what place they are placed in the album. And same yeah. said for a for a live set when you're playing, you know, you can, you yeah. can kind of control the crowd through your music and how you lay it out. And totally. And you know that, um, I mean, you know, uh, Matt has been in a band with me, no name, and also was, was in Hard Richards and he is all about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like yeah. he loves that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I, I, that's one of the things I really enjoyed, especially, you know, when you, you have a couple good songs and you're like, oh man, wait till we break that out at that third or fourth spot. This place is going to go nuts. You know, yeah. they're already warmed up. They're ready to go. And Andres, is, Andres loves, loves that too. Andres is big into the, the, the set order. Yeah. Yeah. We, we will have conversations that last days. <laughs> <don't we? laughs> I will say, Matt and Andres always let, let me handle the, uh, 
set list. But if there was something well, really they must have learned it from you. Then. Yeah, 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 yeah. They definitely did. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but no, on the move was a fun album. Uh, you know, we like I said, we still played one of the songs from there. There's a couple of hits from that song that, or from that album that I wish we would have continued to play. Uh, a very popular song was always Tim's song, and uh, it was about a buddy, you know, growing up and all his yeah. antics he went through. But it kind of just got lost in the mix with new out uh, new songs that we wrote and. It just, you know, it found its way to decide, but Dog Beach was always there. You know, so. it might be a fun thing to do to go back to the first album and do a show where you just play tunes Just off try the to first play the first album. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought about that, and uh, it would be a cool idea. The, fun, yeah. the hard part is, is that most of the guys that are in the band for that first album, you know, or at least our rhythm sex and our drummer and our bass player are no longer with us. So yeah. those guys, Eero would have his work cut out for him trying to figure <laughs> out Stevie McKean's bass lines because he was a talented player, like I said. So in that first album, what were the, um, what were the band members? So uh, the first album would have been Brian. myself, Brian on guitar. We had uh, Jonathan Covitz, Chato on drums. We had Stevie McKean on bass. Cool. Uh, you know, uh, a little bit later on, we added, uh, well, actually, Big A was there from the start, too, always right. messing around, especially, you know, we'd always, you know, mess around on the mics together. And then uh, he was there for the first album, so Alex really? was there, yeah. Alex cool. was on the first album some. And then uh, Dennis, uh, the trumpet player That's from The crazy Worms, came that, over. You guys have all known each other that long. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Brian and myself and Alex and Cub, we were all buds growing up surfing, you know, or hanging yeah. out, you know, I mean, from a young age. Did you guys so. skate, too? Uh, yeah, did a, did a lot of skating and getting hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's one of the ways that I heard a lot of punk rock was on the videos, the skate yeah, videos. Yeah, definitely. Because my, my brother's a big skater. I was okay at it, but I was, you know, in the culture of it. Like, you know, we'd sit and watch skate videos all day long. And that, I heard tons of music that way. Well, you know, around that same time, like the surf culture switched from like that. You know, in the 80s, it was like neon. And in the 70s, it was hippie. And then in the 90s, it was, you know, getting edgier. There's a lot of, you know, surf based punk bands that you know like pennywise stuff like that that those were surfers coming up yeah. with, you know pretty good songs pretty good punk rock had edge to it yet they didn't fit that mold of the long-haired hippie guys that you know used to sing about love and peace and all this these guys are breaking some boundaries and breaking walls and sure you know, and, and, and playing a good high energy punk so yeah. the surf scene had that being infused in it too so nice. it really all came together i remember playing a lot of events where it was you know a surf band Based type of an event, and there was a half pipe set up in the parking lot, and you know everybody's kind of hanging together at that time. It was yeah, fun. you know, it was you know like-minded did, people. We did a lot of that kind of thing. Um, what it was back in the day, I st still to an extent, but back in the day, like extreme sports and surfing and punk were like this. Yeah, they were like the same yep, thing basically. Yeah, yep, you know? yep. every event like that, you know, you, you'd be on it. It would know? be there. Yeah, they'd always have the live bands. We yeah. did events over at Bush Gardens and stuff, and it, it'd be great. As biggest stage we ever played on, you know, the nicest equipment we ever got to work with. You know, our first real official green room and stuff. And you get out there, and you have you know 400, 500 people sitting on the other side of a half pipe, and you're in there jamming like oh, yeah, come yeah. On. <laughs> <laughs> totally, man. yeah we did quite a lot of that stuff with sonic boom six um like the, those kind of you know you show up there to some random like parking lot in the middle of the country somewhere giant half pipe set up <laughs> and all this stuff we did we did all of that it was yeah, awesome. good fun you got to play shows you know uh, absolutely for hey, sure. let's take a look at that um at, at the art for the second album so so this is the second one. What's this one called? This one is What Did You Expect? Yeah. Uh, this was our first album that we got to record with the infamous Rob Roy down at Power Station Studios. Oh, you did it there? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So I've got and 2008 written on here. Yeah, so it's actually because I believe some of this was recorded at his first studio that was in Del Rey. Right. He was in a you know one of those, one of the music areas down there. And then we... I think we went on hiatus for a year or so. None of us liked each other for a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when we got back together, we you know put some pieces back together and went and finished it up down there with Rob at Power Station. Nice. And, he's a uh, good, good guy. Oh, yeah, good guy. He, and he has a lot of patience putting up with us. So. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say that the sound changed from the first to the second album? And yeah. how would you say it changed? Yeah, it definitely did. It definitely did. Um, you know, we went from, you know, being those, you know, younger kids where we were just trying to, you know, scratch a couple more 
songs together to actually having songs that we had taken some time and written and played many times live. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's there's maybe one or two on here that we, you know, didn't have really completed by the time we went in and, you know, got to work on a little bit in studio per se. But a lot of it, we had the, you know, the basic concept ready to go for most of those songs on there. Um, and we also had a lot of new players for this album. This is when uh, uh, Alex had stepped away for a little bit, so Adam Barnes stepped in. Right. And Adam Barnes is, you know, locally, he's, uh, if there's anybody that sings reggae as good as Adam, I'd love to meet him because that kid can have some pipes on him and he can oh, sing. Sick. And he can just, you know, he has that real raw, uh, you know, rude boy style. Yeah, and it's just, yeah. you know, it's undeniable. And he's so amazing. So we got him to come in. Uh, this, it's our first time where we really got to have, uh, you know, more than one horn section. We, so like, real quick, just to jump in in the middle in, yeah. ca- in case the picture gets, comes down. See the, uh, the is that the Jesse Michaels picture? That there on is the, the Jesse Michaels picture. Yeah, on yeah. Right well, there. Christy had, he drew one for, for my wife too. And I, so I recognize the art. Yeah, the art. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's super cool. No, you we'll get back into the story. I just wanted yeah. to ask you about that. Yeah, so what, get horns. Let's get back into that. Yeah, so that's when we finally, you know, progressed a little bit and added, you know, songs that were a little more geared to not just being a four-piece ska punk band uh, with a trumpet player. You know, now we had some tracks laid out. Uh, I believe John Bowes came in and laid down some saxophone on it. We had Dennis still doing trumpet on it. Um, it, it just, it definitely, you know, a fuller sound. Uh, yeah. We, we definitely had, the band had progressed in our ability to write songs that were no longer, you know, one minute long and all about, you know, just partying or whatever silly was going on, it seemed like. Um, the the yeah, music quality and the lyrics to the songs had progressed, you know, as you get older. Uh, so 96, what were you like, sort of like 18, 19? Uh, 96, so, I was actually 20. 20, okay, yeah, so... Yeah, so yeah. Um, all right, so you guys are like you, you guys are like adults by this yeah, time. Yeah, oh yeah, holding down day jobs, you know, yeah, trying yeah. to make, trying to balance the idea of being in a punk rock ska band. You know, you're not playing at eight o'clock at Red Lobster. You're playing nah. at one o'clock at some dingy bar somewhere. And if you got to play your three or four shows for the week to try to make enough money to support the band and support putting out an album and going and recording it, uh, you you have to play these shows and you yeah. have. You know, the part about being a an entertainer, let's say, not just a musician, is there there's a lot of hype that goes with it. You know, you you don't just get off stage, load your stuff up and go right. home. If you want the people to know you and the people That's to the remember fun you, bit. everything else everything, is everything. Yeah, no, the fun part is sitting there and doing it and, and, yeah. and enjoying the crowd and, and getting out there and realizing that these are people you've seen 30 times before and this is going to be the moment you're going to really get to connect with this person but they've seen you and they feel like they've connected with you every single time yeah uh, i always enjoy it i love it i i feel like a lot of people always thought for some reason i was unapproachable unless they knew me and it's like i'm not like i'm just a guy from boynton like you come up and talk let's talk let's have a good time tonight and let you know, yeah let's, man let's let's, let's 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 benefit from knowing each other now and have a good you know a good experience so. totally so you broke up for one year prior to making that album, but the entire previous to that, you'd been doing shows. Pretty and- much doing shows and continuing on, you know, writing music. And, and you know, you, we didn't really, I want to say, after the first album, I remember I was taking some CDs to go sell them at the Boynton Beach Mall, and you could put them on consignment at some of these record stores. So I was walking in there, and there's some random kid sitting outside, and I threw him a CD, and he was like, hey, he was like, uh, you guys need a manager? And I was like, yeah, we need a lot of things, you know? And he was like, well, he goes, I got some connections, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, you know, immediately thinking there's no way. Well, it turns out Dave was a pretty cool guy, well-connected. And, uh, you know, he got us into, you know, some bigger shows. He, nice. He, he, you know, long stories, he's cousins with someone in Goldfinger. So, I mean, he's a cool cat, uh, you know, very connected with that scene. So it helped us get some of these you know, uh, some of the next level shows that we probably would have never gotten to play, sure. uh, you know, with like Long Beach Dub All-Stars, uh, Mustard Plug, a, lo- a lot of bigger names at that time. And we yeah, started yeah. to, we had that album to take to, you know, start playing those songs and it, uh, it took off, you know, it, it, for us, it took off. It was a lot. It seemed, you know. Yeah, sick. You know, it, it, it so was. So is there a show that you remember that's like 
will go down in history as the you, you know your favorite show that you've played? My favorite show that we've ever played. If you want, we yeah. can come back to No, that. no. I mean, you know, one of I, I can think of a couple for sure. One yeah. of my favorites that we ever played was we played at the Foo Bar. Uh, I want to say it was a mustard plug show, probably one of those. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we opened the night. I love that band. And it was the first time we had just started covering Date Rate from Sublime. Yeah. You know, Bradley had just passed, I think, or something. I don't remember what the deal was. But we, uh, for that show, we we opened, and we never opened with a cover song, ever. Yeah, right. And yeah, we yeah. opened with Date Rape. And I just remember looking out, and the people were just going nuts. There, like, n- there was like four rows of hot chicks standing yeah. in the front row. <laughs> I was like, I'm a rock star now. And, yeah, yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was definitely an experience, you know, big stage, great sound, packed house for all the other bands, and they're all paying attention to us, you know, and it was, it was one, of the, one of the more memorable ones as far as that side goes. Um, yeah, man. You know, there's shows that I, I'll always remember uh, for the crazy stuff that happened, you know, the antics, uh, you know, all of us, have, well, I shouldn't say all of us, Alex and I have fallen off a lot of stages. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes caught on video, sometimes not. Um, <laughs> you know, just, just the silliness that goes on like that. Um, you know, there's some that are really memorable. We used to play Dada's a lot, as yeah. you know. And uh, Dada's was like the epitome of being in a band now, like a real band with sound and everything, and playing a house party again, because yeah. that place is so cool of a venue. Totally. And uh, we played a lot of really cool shows there where, you know, you look over, there's a full bar, bartenders pouring you shots as Super you're playing. Super weird, isn't it? You feel and like you're like, in someone's living room. Yeah, yeah, like you're in someone's living room, and like it's amazing, but those are some of my favorites, too, where it's yeah. personal, you, you get off stage, no stage for that instance, and you're with the people again. You're just being a regular person, and it's, it's, it's a uh, that, that those some of those shows are the be- best too. Uh, I agree. The small t- small shows is it, small punk shows is it's what punk is meant for. It always sounds weird if you're in like some huge place, you know, watching Rancid or something, and you're in some big ginormous stadium. It that's not what punk's for. No, it's not. Mm-hmm. You're right. It's meant to, you know, it's meant to be heard on bad speakers, one blown sub underneath the stage, no monitors, and just rock and roll. It, yeah, yeah. You know, and there's a there's a whole. That's that whole scene. That's that whole energy where, you know, we really don't need much and we're going to make the most of, of this. Like, yeah. there's people that are never going to experience the energy that you all in this room are about to experience right now. And yeah. we're doing it for half the cost, <laughs> you yeah. know, quarter of the cost, whatever it is. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a great feeling, you know, that, yeah, that no energy doubt about from it. punk rock in that scene. But be, that being said, there's this Festival Rebellion in England, um, which is like... Um, it has like a million punk bands play every year and they always play in, in these super echoey big rooms and there is something cool about that because the sound again the sound like it's not that great because the rooms is like too echoey yeah, for it yeah. but there's something just super punk rock about the sound being so bad being so bad <laughs> yeah yeah no for sure and, and like i mean we used to play women's clubs like these big vfws that are just these huge empty rooms of no acoustics you know yeah, and it's, yeah, yeah. to set up like we played with a assorted jelly beans that one up in vero one time and Oh, that was a good show. That, that was a fun show, you know? It's just everybody was there. They probably paid five bucks at the door, you know, yeah, and yeah. just there to see, you know, punk rock and or, mm-hmm. or just high-energy, fun music and dance. And, you know, I don't even know if they had alcohol at the show, so it wasn't like one of those, you know, bars. Something that I learned in the U.S. is that, because it's very different in England, like, you know, a lot of people wouldn't consider leaving the house unless there was booze involved, but... Over here, it's slightly different. You know, you get a lot, like the hardcore scene and everything like that. There is a hardcore scene in the UK. I mean, I'm talking 20, 30 years ago as well. I'm not talking now because things are a bit different in the UK now. But, um, like, there was a hardcore scene in the UK, but it, it just didn't seem quite so... Over here, it just seemed to happen a lot more. Yeah, you know, a lot just like more, sober definitely shows, straight you know. edge sober shows. And you know, yeah. we 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 played a few, <laughs> and yeah, it was interesting yeah. for you know for us. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had some run-ins and some fun times, boys. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, the Sonic Boom Six was a similar situation, but you know, we were 
we definitely want to stay. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it wasn't, and I know uh, I remember we, we, you know, we had you know times where we definitely weren't accepted at first, but once we got on stage, they everybody just kind of changed their tune and had yeah. a good time, you know. So, yeah, you can win them around. Yeah, That's yeah, and I, sure. you know, I, I I'd like to think that most of us weren't, uh, you know. Uh, maybe we're a little belligerent. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say a lie right there and say we kept ourselves in control, but anybody that's ever seen us or knows me knows that would be a lie. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at that third album. So um, this this is album number three. Let, this, give me, l- let me know a little is. bit about this. So this is probably the first album where Matt Krug had you know helped us write a lot of these songs. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Matt Krug had a lot of influence on the writing of these songs. Okay. Um, along with Andres, um, we had, you know, the the players we had in the band now were talented musicians that, you know, could hold their own as far as if someone came to the, you know, to practice that night with a new idea, yeah. they could all pick it up in a minute, and all of a sudden this is a brand new song, and you know I'm trying to keep up by this time writing lyrics uh, to songs and ideas that they're coming with at practice, and. You know, Sick. the 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 artistic juices were definitely flowing with the crew at this time. Uh, yeah, it everybody, looks great. It looks everybody awesome. was in sync. Everybody, you know, it was a, a growing period for a lot of the younger guys that were in the band. Uh, things were happening. Progressions were going on in their life that definitely fed the fuel to try to write more music and, and keep them motivated. Um, it did take me a minute as well to realize that the title is is like it, yes. hilarious. Yes, it, yeah, <laughs> n- new direction or new direction, <laughs> as you might read it from the always very classy and uh, witty Hard Richards. Uh, you know, I, I wanted this actually to be a this album. I wanted it to be a spoof on the Pink Floyd. Another brick in the wall and I just wanted it to be a brick wall with a glory hole in the center and it was going to be another dick in the wall but <laughs> they shot me down and said it would never it would never take off <laughs> it never took off anyways <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah uh who's the horn section around this so time, here then? for this oh boy so I think we had a gentleman by the name of Tony playing saxophone here no sorry Tony playing trumpet we had yeah. andres playing trombone yeah. and we would have had kristen knox so playing she's on this album saxophone yes she's on this album and uh she was a new addition to the band for this I, album i think and she deserves special mention she definitely we had, this is where we get to actually highlight the fact that kristen knox was on a hard richards album and uh, there's a lot of irony in all of that because uh, she does not have a penis. Uh, <laughs> she's amazing and she rocks and uh, she's a very talented singer, very talented musician, uh, high energy young lady. She just uh, she demands your attention when you see her yeah. and especially when you hear her, you know, belt out a couple badass tunes on a totally. saxophone. You end up quickly uh respecting everything that young lady does and uh, i have to say when i first saw you guys you know the combination of just being this rocking band and all the high energy um and then just this kind of look that like a lot of ska punk bands don't have you know there was nothing kind of like shy and retiring and sort of like kind of sort of nerdcore about you guys no i I, I like to think that most of us you know do pretty well right there in the spotlight you know none of us really shine away from you know shy away from it and uh yeah 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 we're we're a good looking bunch of guys and gals up there you know you know it's not very often that it's not very often that you could say that like a ska punk band is like sexy you know what i mean (laughs) but i would say that you know you're kind of a sexy well, I will definitely remember that for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually um, the opposite. With it Scott usually Punk is. Band. No, I mean, you know, at this time with Krista in the band, um, you know, we even got to play around with her singing some songs. It brought a new aspect to it, uh, even in the recording aspect. Now we had a female vocalist doing some of the backup and backing vocal tracks and things, and it just. 
it added something to the band that there was never there before, obviously. And by this time, you know, there's a four minute song on this album and that was never heard of from us. And like we had songs that were completely structured. I mean, I don't know how the band did it. Yeah. I just know where I was supposed to sing and when I was supposed to sing. But by this time, we really had songs that were, uh, you know, detailed. And, and from what I've gathered from other musicians, some of them are difficult to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, I've given it a well, I, I, I've played a couple of them over the years because we, I, I think we, we played a couple with No Name Scar Band. And we I, have. I, I've gotten to jump up on stage with you guys. I was stoked. You covered one of our songs. Yeah, and I got to sing yeah. it with you. It was a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good times, man. Good times. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, crossover between the two bands because um, obviously Matt and Andres. Yep. You yep. know, and then also the rehearsal space. Yep. And, and also, um, you know, the, the kind of people that come to the shows. You know, there was yeah. a, there, there's this, there's just this kind of, I feel, I feel like really sort of, you know, peas in a pot a little bit. You know, oh, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. uh, I have a feeling that if you would have grown up here, we would have been buddies just like all the rest of us were, or vice yeah. versa. If I was over there with your cats, we would have been hanging and doing the same darn thing, brother. So, yeah, exactly. You know, it yeah. takes a, that, that's, that's one of the things about this. You know, it, you, you think it's like a, there's like a cutthroat aspect to musicians, like, you know, they're, they're jealous. And I think, uh, again, I had mentioned it earlier, but, you know, the, the only time that, like, you're, you're jealous or you're, you're mad or you, you're angry about something because you probably don't understand it, you know? Yeah. So when you have you guys did say like that to me earlier, and, 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 you know, I, I 100% agree. The only reason you, you know, the only reason you'd be a dick about something is if you just, if you don't get it. Because if you it. understand it, you either, you either respect it for what it is, yep. or, or you understand the reasons why, why it someone is. else would think that. And, hey, it's, it's good. I'm not going to change that. So I, I, and that's, you know, that's also punk rock. That's that community yeah. aspect where, hey, something's completely different, and I, I'm, I'm gonna. It's not like I'm gonna pretend that I don't notice. I'm just gonna embrace it just like like every like everything else that I embrace. You know, yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna make a reason why I have to like this. I'm gonna like this because this is what I like. Yeah. This is what makes me feel good. You know, it's uh, the epitome of writing a song. You know, if if I play a couple chords that sound good. Uh, what made that sound good to me, you know? And, and, yeah. then, and then I usually go, okay, well, where am I stealing this from? Because if I, if I like the way it sounds, it's probably someone else's song yeah, that I'm, I'm ripping off it. right now. So. Tell me about it. I, <laughs> I once had a writing, a writing partner who just had a really good idea for, like, when I was stealing other people's stuff, and it just drive me nuts. I'd be like, oh, how about this? And be like, well, it's this. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, I, I was fired up one night at practice. I had, like, this... The, I, I'm trying to remember the, the, what the wording I had, I had, but I had, like, a whole little you know a good a good hook you know in my head and i came and i'm like man what what do you do this do this and, and my drummer's looking at me he's like that's so and so i'm like what there's a song like that and even when i went and listened to it i didn't recognize the song but somewhere yeah. subliminally i had heard that and it stuck and it came back out as my own tune in my own head but that never worked <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um in terms of writing process like what did did you guys have one how did that work uh it was uh you know, very often someone would have an idea. Uh, you know, I think it would always start, everybody walks in, starts plugging in their equipment. Steve yeah. grabbed a microphone, so I grab a microphone and, you know, in the tuning process or something, you know, or so, all of a sudden Eero would start playing a bass line that he was messing with at home and Brian starts skanking to it and all of a sudden there's a drum drum kicking on it now and Matt looks at it and starts, you know, skanking or doing a little bit of rhythm behind Brian's and it's like now I have something that's perfect I've never heard before and every thought that's in my head right now I get to go and just throw it out there. Yeah, and, uh, sick. Usually something would stick from that as far as the vocals go, you know, maybe maybe I just randomly, you know, spit one good little banger that I'm like, oh, I remember that, I remember that. And sometimes I yeah. just keep repeating that type of a verse over and over and falling back to it yeah. so that I remember it. Uh, and very often, you know, we always joked, we're like, we should just get a recorder and put a recorder and press record so we, we remember this stuff later because sure. all of a sudden it gets buried under... You know, especially as you're if you're practicing for a big show or something, all of a sudden you're like, well, we got to get to the set that we wrote for that, and we'll come back to that later. And mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, 
we'll, we'll try to come back to it. But as far as a lot of stuff gets forgotten. Yeah. Oh yeah, brutal. yeah. There's so many songs and probably so many songs that would have been so much better than the stuff we did record that we never <laughs> remembered. Uh, you know, and we uh, I talked to Brian often and stuff, and we're like, man, could we imagine if we could find that tape from that four track from back in '96? That thing would be so gold right now. You That's know? so cool. I, I had a I had an eight track. Um, mini disc recorder yeah so i never had the i never had the tape no i did i did have a four track right that was my first thing yeah, yeah. and then i got an eight track after that the mini disc recorder was actually pretty good i mean it had yeah. no, almost no memory but it was no, like I, really cool no i mean we you know we had to you know figure it out as it went but i i remember you know doing it that way when it first started but you, Do you know remember getting, how much hiss there were on those oh tapes? gosh <laughs> yeah no, that made me sound a lot better actually <laughs> <laughs> but you know as far as you know writing new songs very often it would start with something like that or you know sometimes uh it would go up on the board at this you know at the warehouse and it, it's we had a weird way because at least for me I, i'm no musician i can't read music or anything so we would literally say okay we're going to do that four times and then we're going to do that six times and you're going to go back to that for two times and then we're going to do that six times and i would write on the board like two times six times and yeah, i don't yeah. know i don't know what like there was no description of what was being done two times yeah. or six times but the the, the the spacing was there the timing yeah. was there you know the, the amount of bars it went or whatever yeah, and, uh, yeah. and then that would lead to one of the players remembering what the heck that was and then we had at least that there and hopefully that next time I would come I would have some lyrics written for it or something and uh, gotcha. you know I've, I've always had too many lyrics in my head for the amount of songs that were available do so you, I was do, never... you, do you write them down I do uh, but r- very randomly in, in terrible places you know right, I, right. I, have, I have probably like 30 lyric books at home from over okay. the years some that might have literally three songs and then six pages of uh, I like, you know, they're like, they're not the title of the song, but if I have a hook or an idea or something I want to write a song about, uh, I'll write it on the top of that page, Yeah, whatever yeah. it is. And then maybe I'll go back and, you know, write something underneath it or, you know, whenever it is. Or nowadays I have notes on my phone where it's like I have four verses of a song that's never going to be a song and maybe I can make it a cool poem or a Hallmark card or something. But, <laughs> you know, it's like it, there's these all these sporadic lyrics and pages of notes of songs around that, yeah. you know, some I, are written. I can relate. Not. My phone is, is just, you know, if you go to the notes on my phone, it's just never-ending. Never-ending ideas. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll be driving down the road. And, Not that many of them are very good, but, you know, you you got to kind of like, I, I just sort of go with the law of averages, you know, eventually one's yeah, yeah, going to be yeah, right. Yeah, I got a thousand ideas. Ask me a thousand questions. One's going to be right. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the monkey's Shakespeare thing, you know. For sure, for um, sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we were talking a little bit about the punk scene back in the day. How do you feel like it's changed over the years? Like, how do you feel about the punk scene these days? Uh, well, I... You know, I think just like everything else, it's just gotten to the point where we're never going to, just like our parents always said, it's never going to be like it was back in the day. Oh, I feel like we're never going to have that personal feeling like maybe we yeah. did at one time. Uh, you know, props to prop for always having that spot. There was, There's still clubs, you know, respectables. There's still places that put on these shows. And, you know, the kids that show up, you know, much love for them all. They, they still dance the same way, and they, they tend to, you know, act the same way, with, you know, with, without, you know, a lot of this, these shows going on the way they seem to use, they used to go on. Um, yeah. You know, it, there was a time there where, you know, almost once a month there was a good punk show going on in, in Palm Beach County somewhere. And yeah. it definitely isn't the same. There's still great new bands out there like Billy Doom is Dead. And, you know, it's caught my attention a couple of times. Uh, you know, there's, there's still bands out there playing good music. Uh, I just don't think. I feel right now, like right now, it feels like we're on the verge of it getting better. Like, like, like busier. I just feel like there's bands. I give it a year, and I think a lot things will be looking a bit different. I know so many people who are on the verge of releasing music or starting different new bands and things. Be interested to check back in on the scene in a year and see how it's doing because um, I'd, from where I'm standing, or maybe it's just the people I know. Yeah, where yeah. I'm standing, it just feels like something's about to happen. About to about to pop off. Yeah, here. Well, yeah. You know, it's not that's it wasn't the natural progression that should have happened. You know, as we all know, I think COVID 
you know, when COVID hit and it, all these bars and all the venues and all the touring bands had to, you know, shift gears and find a different way to keep moving and stay productive and artists to be able to find a way to keep getting their art out to the masses. Yeah. Um, you know, it changed the focus and it gave people a new concept of what is, you know, what is good. So now we can, you know, as you know, you can, you can record here and your buddy, uh, you know, in, in Texas could record his part and we don't even yeah. have to be in the same room anymore. And you can actually, that, yeah. yeah, you can put together music without even being in the same room, which yeah. is weird for me because, you know, growing up, you know, we had to go to practice, you know, and all get together that's, and lug your that gear. That side of it too is really important. Yeah, no, like that's, that's socialization. Oh you know? man, it's the epitome of where we're at now with yeah. life. Like people would rather watch a YouTube video of a live band and go to the show show and see the live band yeah. and, and i you you I, i'll be the first to tell you we never caught the energy and the real hard richards on an album no i know it yeah. never happened like yeah, what yeah. what i i look, that energy and that that feeling that the spirit I, yeah the spirit and like like i think you knew where you were that night you knew you were at a hard richard show i think the energy or or any good punk rock show you know everybody's vibing looking around they're gleaming because they know that you know whoever it is whether it's rancid whether it was no name whether it was us whether anybody when you, that energy is there and people yeah. are ready for it. I think when you take that away and you, uh, you know, you, I, I did this and I'm going to give it to you guys and you're going to send it back around and we're going to put out a video or a music video of it um, without anybody ever coming to experience what we are live. Yeah, that, yeah. It's it, totally I think different. You miss, yeah, you're missing. I don't, I don't think it's live music anymore. Obviously, no. it's not, you know, but. Uh, no, you're right. It's a totally different beast and, and you know, you've got to be careful like not to just completely normalize never spending any time with each yeah, other <laughs> yeah like that was that's why we played music was so yeah. that there was something uh, it gave us another reason to go and everybody get together like hey yeah. the, the richards are playing in lake worth tonight everybody come out you know and everybody comes out and also like people who are a little introverted you know and i can believe it or not like include myself in this um the fact that you kind of had to go out was very good for you. Yeah, yeah, you know I mean? yeah. <laughs> like, makes you gets you to do something. It's yeah, easy yeah. to fall. I mean, life is life. It's it's the same for, I think, for any of us. Like people that work in an office and now they're working from home. I think that's a big change right there. And it's the same thing. Like for us, our office would be a stage or something. And when you can confine that to a home studio and you're just not really ever getting out there and feeling the the, you know, feeling the masses. That sounds terrible. Maybe that's a good album name. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, like get out and, and be part of the scene and get be part of other people and, and yeah. their interactions with them is key. Like, oh, I'm that guy. Like, I walk through a Publix and I smile at every random person that walks by me. I'm like, how you doing today? You know, uh, that's just me. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. one of the, I probably make introverted people feel very, very uncomfortable because <laughs> I'm way too outgoing. Um, but I also feel like sometimes by, if I have that in me, that that's supposed to be shared. Like, it's a positive yeah. energy. Like, I, I, I like to know that you, generally I like to make people smile and people, you know, make people as stoked as I am over nothing you know yeah, like it dude. doesn't take much to fire me up and I'm I'm ready to go and just like spread all that love like make everybody feel it too and, and get that energy no so. doubt about it and talking of that energy why don't we listen to um, some of your music so oh, we, we're cool. going to check a video out right now and we'll be right back
We are also sponsored by Oasis Root. Now, Oasis Root Carver Bar is in Sea Grape Square on Indian Town Road. And it is a carver bar. If you don't know anything about carver, it's a Polynesian root that you grind up and you mix with water. And it has been in Polynesia for potentially thousands of years. It's, a, it's an old thing that um, they used for kind of ceremonial and also um, sort of ledger purposes. It, it's meant to be something where, you know, that brings people together. Um, you all take a, a shell of carver and chink them together and say bula and have it together like that. It's meant to be something to bring people together. It uh, has a kind of an effect, which is, I guess, a kind of a slightly warming effect. and uh, just kind of makes you feel a, a, a nice. It's not particularly intoxicating. It's not like drinking alcohol. So the atmosphere in a carver bar is sort of like um, a cross between a regular bar and uh, a coffee house. It's pretty chill in there. Um, you get all sorts of different types of carver bars. Some of them are more like a club, you know, this sort of like black light and EDM playing. And some of them are more like a cafe. This is one of the cafe type of ones. It's it's super chill in there. If you're looking for somewhere to, I don't know, maybe go and do some work on your laptop or go and have a chat with friends, it's perfect for that kind of thing. There's a foosball table in there if that's your jam. Or baby foot, as they call it in France. And... Uh, yeah, Jim, the owner, is a really cool guy, and he has very kindly sponsored our podcast. So thank you very, very much for that, Jim. They also do a poker night in there. All sorts of things going on at Oasis Root Carver Bar. 561 Music is sponsored by Live Music Community. It's where we film the podcast that you're listening to right now, and it's also where I work. Gavin, Hector's son, was a student here for a long time, and in many ways he's the musician he is today because of the teachers at Live Music Community. We taught him not only about his instrument, but also about being in a band. And his band, Unemployed Youth, accomplished a lot of goals, mostly band etiquette, how to work together, and all of the nitty-gritty that goes into being in a band on a day-to-day -day basis. The student signs up for lessons, learns their instrument, joins a real band, and decides the direction it goes in. And we can take people from very young age, you know, six or seven years old, all the way up to 80. You know, there's no age limit here. Um, we've run an adult program for people who want to be in a band as adults. But really, the main focus is on the on the kids and getting them playing together and in bands. Um, we are also a studio, a live stream venue, and can, we can record audio or video. The Killbillies live album, Warts and All, was recorded here. It was recorded during a live stream that we did during COVID. Justin had a great idea to record live streams during COVID. A ton of bands came in and it was a real success. Um, but outside of that, we can record albums. We can help you with your EPK. And we have full audio visual capabilities here. LMC is in Palm Beach Gardens on the northwest corner of Military Trail and North Lake Boulevard. It's north of the gas station right before you get to North Lake on Military Trail. And if you go to livemusiccommunity.com, you have all the information you'll need right there. Thanks. All right, so we're back and we just listened to uh, Jägermeister by The Hard Riches. Can you tell us a little bit about the song? Oh, well, uh, first off, I hate Jägermeister, so stop buying me Jägermeister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it was one of those tunes... Um, uh, Matt, I believe Matt had the riff and uh, came at it, and he, he actually had the idea, I believe, of writing a song, you know, for Jägermeister. And, uh, you know, back in the lab I went and, you know, wrote wrote the tune, and uh, it was kind of, you know, I kind of used the tune as, like, what would happen to me if I drank Jägermeister and went out for that night. And, uh, you know, how the progression of... Um, you know, a night would take you, and that's kind of like the video concept, too, that goes with this song is, like, you know, a person's having a bad day, and it was like a magic potion type of trick, you know, like, here, take some of this, and you're going to have a good night, you know, yeah, come yeah. in, and you know, all of a sudden you're in a show in the Hard Richards, and it progresses from there. It's like the time of your life, you know, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, playing music, you know, and just, just in general, the uh, the song... It, it's a little story, you know, it's a little story just being told there for sure about, uh, you know, probably overindulging with a little bit of Jägermeister <laughs> and some of the experiences that I definitely had. Um, 
But again, like I said, it's funny, you know, you write a song like that and everybody thinks, oh, they love the Jägermeister. And you look at the front of the stage during a live show and there's 10 shots lined up and it's all Jägermeister. And you're going, I'm never going to make it through this. You yeah, know, so for you real. You start doing the old trick where you look like you're doing it. You turn your head. <laughs> it's getting thrown all over Evan back there in the drums. <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, like, um, those sweet high alcohol liqueurs Ugh. were for a minute there they were my thing and i think that was the, i think that was really at the end but you know one of the things that drove me to stop like, drinking i don't need this anymore in yeah, my life yeah. yeah no there's there's for sure like you know i'm one of those guys i could i could have a beer and be good you know and like i don't need to have eight beers but uh boy you put a couple shots in me and all of a sudden uh, you know i think i'm invincible and it's four o'clock in the morning and i got off stage five hours ago and i didn't even have a shirt on when i got off stage and now i don't know where half of my clothes are <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it can progress really quickly and i i think uh you know i think jägermeister actually is pretty fitting for a song for us to have uh, written because uh i think that kind of goes hand in hand with drinking it and uh what kind of way that we lived our lives and what yeah. we were going through and and uh, what we were putting out there for people was kind of one of those things like, well, you're about to get fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. It's a party song. You know? Yeah, it's definitely a party song for sure. Uh, you know, it's one of our first, you know, real videos that we put together. And, you know, we had, uh, I'm trying to think of the cat's names that did I'm Sorry Boys, but uh, Matt had some buddies, you know, do, do all the video for it and did it in a bunch of takes. You know, you play the same song like, 15, 20 times, and then the masterful editing, you know, they edit it all together, and it comes out looking like this polished, beautiful thing, and I, I can't believe it turned out as good as it did as far as a music video for what we put into it, and it was, it was a fun night for sure, and yeah, a man. cool experience getting to record a song like that where it's not just us doing a live show, it was meant to record that song, so everybody, yeah, sure. people had their parts that they had to play, and it was it was a cool experience for sure, something yeah, we'd never done man. before, so... That's awesome. So um, one of the things we like to do in the second half, seeing as we were listening to an ad for um, Live Music Community, is do you have any advice for upcoming musicians? Oh, man, yeah. Well, there's a lot of advice, uh, but let's, uh, let's try to narrow it down, I guess. You know, um, you know, music is meant to, you know, transcend and, and, and give people a feeling that you're feeling, whether you wrote the song or whether it's a song you like and you're covering uh, you know, it, it's a it's a gift that we have, and it's a way for us to express ourselves to people. So, always stay focused on the idea that you know you're gonna you're gonna progress, you're gonna get to that next point where you finally get on a stage. You know, if that's what you want. You know, some people might just want to play music at home, and I I think it's amazing. There's plenty of amazing musicians out there that we're never going to get to hear because that's all they do is sit in yeah. their room and it's it, just like there's plenty of artists that you're never going to get to see their art and I, I said it a few times tonight and I think I do it a lot is like I compare you know music's an art you know and it's, it's meant to be enjoyed and perceived by the public with their own eyes and, and their own uh, opinions of it so yeah. don't get don't get you know, upset if, you know, you write a song that means a lot to you and uh, it, it's not, you know, uh, going viral, you know, next week. It's, it, that's not what this is about. You know, you're supposed to do something that you love and you put your heart and soul into it uh, and you you can go to sleep that night knowing that you just poured it out and you just gave it to whoever was there, whether it's five people or 500 or, or you yeah. just doing it in your home and you, you put that guitar away and your fingers hurt and you're stoked and you're smiling and you wake up tomorrow thinking about that song that you last played. It's a, yeah. it's a great thing. It, it, it's easy to get disappointed and think that, uh, you know, there's, it's it's not you're not going to get famous or you're not going to get big and you know, who can, it's not about that it's about enjoying what you're doing and if you have a story to tell someone's going to want to listen to it and you know I know yeah. I will for sure so no, stay totally. focused on what what we're doing here and that's you know expressing yourself the best way you can yeah so absolutely and I think when when it comes down to it um, there's it's a it's a multifaceted thing. Like um, the, the, there's the business side of it, but then there's also just the reality of playing music and being part of 
other people playing music, which is just very good for you. It's a form of therapy. It's it's social. You know, it brings us together, and and you get to express yourself, and that that's really you know the only important side of music. Like the business side of it is almost ancillary to that. It's just you know it you know totally wouldn't it is. be cool if we could make money out of it as well? Yeah, you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I mean, all the years that we played, I don't think we ever envisioned ourselves you know making money off of it i think most of the time we were like okay what do we have to do to keep this going yeah. uh, you know uh you know what's it take to play this music because it's not you know you gotta you have to invest into it you have to sometimes work hard at another job so you have the money to buy the equipment you want so you can do what you want but i mean if you were an artist sitting at home drawing a picture uh, you know, you'd have to get, you know, the supplies to do that too. So to be able to do these things, it takes dedication and hard work. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, it takes a lot of patience too, especially in the sense that we're in a band and you got all these different people, all these different mindsets, all these different walks of life, all these different views of what our art is coming together, collaborating. Uh, there's times where, uh, you know, maybe I'm not right, and I got to let everybody else do, you know, work on what they were going to do. And th- when it comes back to the table, it's 10 times better because I did, you know, let go of those reins for a moment. And uh, there's always a time and a place to speak up. But when you're in a community like that or a band and you want to get something accomplished, everybody's got to come together, yeah. put all the egos aside, and just take the steps together and help each other progress. No so. doubt, man. And talking about, you know, doing good things in the world um can you tell us a little bit about future six yeah yeah so uh you know when the towards the end of the band when we weren't playing as many shows uh i'm one of those people that needs to you know be involved in something i like to stay active uh if i if i sit too long i don't know what would happen so um my buddy Donnie Ottaferro had started Future Six many years before that. We used to play shows for him for benefits and things like that to raise money for the nonprofit. And uh, they did a lot of programs working with special needs children, um, you know, trying to give those kids a, a break or the families a break from the, every, the everyday routine. So sure. uh, they were doing a surfing program and... Uh, I was like, use me, you know, put me into this somehow. And uh, I remember the first few times I would go and volunteer, and we're talking 7 o'clock on a Saturday morning, and, I mean, we're leaving Profit 4 after playing a show, and I'm like, i got to go home, got to get cleaned up, try to eat some food and go. And I did that one time, and I never put myself in that position again. If I had a surf program the next day to go volunteer for, it quickly meant so much to me that I would put other things aside yeah, and make yeah. sure that I was ready to go fresh and, you know, rock and roll at 7 a.m. Yeah, and dude. all of a sudden it turned into something where I, you know, being a little outspoken, as some people might know me, uh, I, I had the ability to transcend that stoke to these children that, um, you know, might not be receptive to any type of other people usually, uh, yeah. you know, dealing with uh, nonverbal autistic children or children with cerebral palsy or even blind children, uh, taking them surfing and letting them even just experience the beach for the first time. And it was just something all so new for me, uh, you know, growing up surfing, it's very localized. Like you don't want more people at your beach, you know, more people learn how to surf just means there's going to be less ways for me. And when I, you know, as I got older, I quickly realized, just like I said a few times, that, you know, this is a community. we got to try to help each other uh, more so than thinking, you know, uh, I, that this, you know I'm, I'm not, that's not for me. It's not my place. Uh, there's a place for everybody, especially when it comes to volunteering. Yeah. Um, it's a, one of the things that you can do, and the more you do it, you, you might not get something back, you know, monetarily or something like that. But, man, to, hearing a story like... Uh, uh, having a young child as nonverbal autistic say my name and the mom looked at me with tears in her eyes she's like he doesn't speak he's never said anybody's name he just said your name and it's yeah. like it almost brings a tear to my eye now thinking about how something that I never envisioned 
would be what I'm influencing somebody with. You know, uh, yeah. I always thought it would be the music or something. And now I'm standing on a beach with a megaphone in my hand, you know, you know, just, you know, cracking little jokes with people and, and, and just being that cheerful self I am, it transcends right to that crowd of people too. Yeah, dude. And it was so, the, po- the positive vibe, you know, and, and the high energy again, uh, all of a sudden I was the, you know, uh, surf program director and, you know, putting all this together at a committee underneath me and uh, with the help with Don, and the rest of the uh, uh, nonprofit, uh, we really built that into something big. You know, we'd have 50 kids out there on a morning, 100, 150 volunteers, and everybody coming together, all donations, and just giving these kids a full day of stoke. And yeah, it, it was really cool. And, and it really gave me something, you know, to uh, to wake up every morning and be stoked for. Uh, something we well, you know. I tell you what, it's uh, you know, as some I've got some with special needs in my family, and it's and it's a uh, you know that 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 is a lot of work for for parents for the family in general and just having stuff they can do is super important yeah especially where they can sit back get behind their camera snap pictures of their kid having yeah. a great day uh, you know whatever however it was uh, it was really, really a, a fun time, you know, and, and, it, and it it built a lot of, uh, get, even at 40-something years old, it, I, I grew you know, yeah. tremendously I going through that. those experiences and, and getting to, you know, speak with families, you know, that I never probably would have gotten to speak with before, you know, yeah. some of these families, I would have never had an interaction with them before, and when I get to sit there and speak with them and connect with, you know, a, a gentleman that has a daughter who's blind and, you know, just trying to understand the concept of what his life must be like and for him to be interested and sit there and want to talk to me, like take time out of what he's already having to stress with and, and he's gaining something from this conversation and the time together. Uh, it was really, it's really cool. Um, you know, and, and nice, that whole man. organization, we did a, a lot of work for the community. Um, so, um, I played a um, a thing um, up in at Terra Formata, didn't yes, I? Did, yeah, you, yeah, that was yeah. a benefit, wasn't it? For that, the, that was actually, I, I do believe that might have been a benefit for Donnie. For Donnie, yeah, yeah. For Donnie. Uh, you know, he's in a, a a fight of his life right now with cancer, and he's 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 kicking its butt. You know, and it's yeah, it's tough. But uh, there's there's not a more positive person uh, that that is prepared. for to get kicked while he's down and get back up than Donnie Adafaro. Uh, gotcha. This guy is an animal. He's always had that 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 spirit where he wanted to help others, and I think that comes around, and the only way you can be willing to help others is if you're a strong person in yourself and you believe Absolutely. in yourself. So he's got a big team behind him. He's going through a lot right now. I love you, Donnie. Uh, you know, my prayers are with you, man. My positive thoughts always. I know he's up in Boston today, I believe, actually doing some alternative uh, treatments, trying to get you know ahead of this. Uh, this battle that he's in and uh, right. you know so yeah we we've done a few bun- fundraisers for him uh the last year or two uh we haven't done a lot in sense of community work and we're hoping to get back to it here very soon as soon as donnie's back and ready to rock and roll yeah so, okay you know cool. that's a def- it's definitely a big thing and there's always a need in the community for you know a helping hand for sure yeah for so. sure man is, it, is there ever so um do you think that there's any uh chance that um the Hard Richards will play another show. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I love music, and, and uh, obviously, there's a lot of pieces that have to come together to make it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all on good terms. Everybody, you know, we're all boys. You know, so it's that a never, never say changed. never situation. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would never say never. I just can't tell you that there's any plans in the works right now. Yeah, but yeah. If, if two of them were to come to me and tomorrow and say let's do it, I could probably convince the other three or four to do it, and we'd probably play a show. Yeah, yeah that's but, awesome. You know, hey, <laughs> and, and some things, you know, it's. Uh, it's hard to put that on the shelf and completely walk away from it. You know? Yeah, it is, and you know, I, I, so, you know, I've played shows before, um, uh, where, that you, you know you've been at, uh, um, and I see in you the same thing I have in me, where you know you're watching a band and you're just like. God damn it! I wish I was doing yes. that right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I feel the exact same yes, way. So it I is, could just see know, it. You know, it's yeah. like sitting on the beach when there's good waves, and I, my surfboard isn't there. So it yeah, drives yeah. me crazy. I, 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 I tell people. I always, uh, I'm doing it again. I always make the art reference, but it's like, uh, for me. It's like uh, you know, wanting to draw a picture, and there's no there's no pencil to use. Yeah, you know, I got a piece of paper. I got all these ideas, but I don't get to put them down on that paper anymore. So, well, I'm doing this. Um, 
collaborative thing so we'll have you come and do a verse on uh, that I'm man. stoked I'm ready to rock it yeah man. hell definitely, yeah definitely and listen um, thanks so much for coming on the podcast I really appreciate it It's it's been a pleasure having you and um, I love the band and, and, and you've always been super nice and and cool with me and you know like when I was playing with Matt and everything I, you know I felt like I sort of came into a little bit of a family a little bit no, you, know? you definitely did and, yeah. and, um, and yeah it's been a pleasure been a pleasure hanging out with you all these years and at shows and and um, am I going to see you on the 23rd you coming down to yeah I'll one? be out there on the 23rd at Prop yeah, to hang yeah, out the No Name Ska Band I think it's a it's a packed bill there's going to be a lot crazy, of bands yeah, it's gonna be, is dead, is on yeah, there, yeah I'm looking forward to seeing and them the, boys again and the fat dudes yeah, is on there. Yeah. yeah it's now gonna... I'll be there. I already got my Sunday morning planned with nothing going on. There you so, go. Uh, That's we the will trick. be in action on Saturday night. I'm looking Hell forward yeah. to it, man. Definitely. Nice definitely. one. So what's Kilbilly's got coming up? We have let's do a quick thing here. Um this weekend, Kilbilly's is playing a sailfish brewery up in Fort Pierce on Friday. From 7 to 10. And then from 7 to 10 in Avacoa on Saturday, we are playing at Das, Das Beer Garden. It's just called Das now, though, I think. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. I think that's Got that's the adventures shows. of uh, Kilverleys this weekend. They're both kind of earlier shows, both 7 to 10. One of, all the way up in Fort Pierce and then um, and then on Saturday in Avacoa. So uh, thanks so much for coming yeah, It was on, a man. pleasure, brother, for sure, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. what you're doing here in the community for everybody. It's a fun little show, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, and, man. And, and, you know, like, I really enjoy doing it. And Hector does too, so, you know, long may it last. Yeah, and, um, yeah, so uh, if you... Um, want to find us online it's really easy easy you just go to um 561 music podcast is all the socials and then and then 561 music.com is the website and uh yeah you know come and find us online and have a chat to us um all of that stuff is is very alive um danielle you know or me or hector will get right back to you if you get in touch with us on the socials and um yeah i guess until we meet again and until next time nice one thanks rock and roll see ya